Um, limitations, we already mentioned a few of these. Obviously, the, we couldn't blind people to the intervention itself. Um, there was a metronome. There was timing lights. There was a gauge that actually showed you uh, uh, the pressure that you were compressing with and decompressing with. Um, it's very hard when you've got multiple things happening to know exactly what individual pieces are key. Um, the other thing is this study was actually terminated uh, after five years because the funding ran out, but they were still a, but they didn't know the results at the time of the uh, termination. Um, and they did lose some patients to, uh, because they weren't able to get consent from follow-up on all cases. They had a third arm that actually was going to look at ITD alone without the, I, without the active compression, decompression, CPR, but that was dropped early on because they didn't have enough money to continue all three arms, and they didn't have enough uh, patients uh, being enrolled in that study. So their conclusion was basically that uh, compared to standard CPR, a com combination of an active ITD plus active decompression CPR, compression decompression resulted in significantly increased survival of the hospital discharge with good neurological function that persists out to one year. Now, the natural questions to all of you come, well, what's the difference between these two and what, what conclusion can we take? These are di slightly different studies, um, and, and, and on this slide you can see the comparison between Rock Prime versus the rescue trial. The n primary outcomes were the same. Um, however, the mechanism of chest recall was very different. One of the things we're learning is that one of the key components of CPR is to make sure you get complete chest recoil. If you don't get complete chest recoil, you interfere with the CPR mechanics and you actually don't get good CPR at all. So in one case, you were able to assure active chest recoil, and the other one you relied on passive recoil. I don't think the lend, uh, I don't think the endpoints are that different. Um, uh, the uh, the the other thing that's big is the uh, time to device placement. The average time in the Rock Prime study was about 9.8 minutes, whereas in the uh, I in the rescue trial it was about 6.5 minutes. And obviously the studies were different. One was neutral versus the other one being positive. What are the implications for us? I think that these are things we need to think through. I think that clearly based on this study, the ACD CPR with an ITD appears to be superior to standard CPR. The cardio pump is not currently available in the United States. It's not been FDA approved from what I can gather. It costs 300 pounds, which is roughly about 600 US dollars in, in England. Um, the rescue pod is available, which is the I ITD. That costs about $100. Um, we also know from the Rock Prime study that ITD alone with standard CPR does not, be, does not appear to be better than, than just regular CPR. So I think that you know, the, the take home point I get from these is that you know, at some point all communities are going to have to basically consider a combination of active compression, decompression CPR plus an ITD. Um, there are other questions that we need to find out and we need to answer. Uh, we don't know whether um, you know, is is the release much better uh, with just, uh, you know, can we make our, if you're doing passive, if you're just doing manual compressions and getting passive release, can we improve on our passive release by teaching people not to s lean on the chest and stay on the chest? Um, we know that when people get tired, for example, they tend to actually lean on the chest more and that actually prevents, act, you know, uh, complete release. We also don't know how much the ITD contributed um, in the rescue trial. So another trial that needs to be done is an ACD CPR trial with a real ITD valve and a sham ITD valve to see what's truly added by adding the ITD. We also know that the compression rates were different. Um, maybe if we slowed our compression rates with standard CPR to 80, we might get better release and we might be able to get better outcomes. So is the right rate 80, 100, 120? I think they chose 80 because when you're using the manual device uh, uh, to, to actually push on the chest, you can actually ensure better outcome with that. Questions? So th that's a good question as well. Uh, the question is, are there any studies coming down on the mechanical CPR device? Uh, a trial that just got concluded was something called the CERC trial. The CERC trial was looking at the autopulse device. The autopulse device was previously studied in a study called Aspire by the Seattle uh, King County group along with four or five other uh, communities and was actually showed to be no difference. In fact, showed perhaps there to be harm. Uh, the CERC trial, which was a repeat of the uh, Aspire trial, showed no difference. Uh, there was no difference in outcome between using the autopulse 
versus the um, manual CPR. Now there's another device out there called the Lucas device. Uh, some of you may have seen the Lucas device. The Lucas device is actually a little bit like ACD CPR. It actually uses a suction cup and actually gives you complete, uh, it pulls back and it gives you more active recoil. And uh, I have not seen any randomized control trial. There is a study that's that, that, that the people are talking about doing with, with the Lucas device, but it's a great question. Yes, John. Correct. Uh, so the main difference between the, it's a good question, is the, is the ITD study that is commercially available and the one that's used in the study different? The answer is yes. The ITD that's commercially available has a lower what's called uh, cracking pressure. I think it's minus 12, uh, whereas the uh, ITD used in the study was minus 16, as was no noted on some of the slides. I don't think it probably makes uh, as much a difference um, as, um, as, as I think uh, we, we, at least I don't think we know how much difference that makes. It's a good question. Somebody else? Say? Correct. Right. So there's not much data on the right rate. Um, the only data that we have today on the rate suggests that a rate of um, uh, that, 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 that I've seen is some observational data from ROC that all of you have participated in. It suggests that there's benefit up to a rate of about 120, and after that it drops. What we don't know is 80 better than 100 and 120. The problem is when you go faster, you don't get enough time for the heart to actually fill, and you potentially prevent recoil. I think what the rescue trial tells me more than anything is that the concept of recoil letting the chest come back up is so crucial that you can't, you can't cheat and try to go fast at the expense of recoil. So I think that's the take home point. A couple of quick slides I just want to show you. Um, uh, uh, the first recorded rhythm, there was very similar uh, uh, benefit across all rhythms, but mainly it was the benefit was in VF uh, and VT. This was a slide getting back to the previous question about consistency across sites. The rescue trial was done in several sites, and you can see there was consistency across all the sites. In all the sites, they found better uh, improved outcomes with the, with, with the active compression, decompression, ITD arm. Um, and this again showed you that basically there was very little difference in the hospital uh, except for cardiac catheterization. So, and, and that basically kind of gives you the survival over time, showing that it was much better. So, um, you know, I, I think that, um, um, Uh, uh, She's going to bring up the next presentation. Any other questions? Yes, sir. One thing I noticed is they don't seem to put any emphasis on hospital arrival guides from the time that it was applied. Did they, is there any particular reason why they didn't include delay in transport or anything like that? Uh, Elaborate on your question a little bit. Hospital arrival time. You mean the the the, uh, the, the transport time? Yeah. yeah. The transport time actually has been looked at, and I don't think is a strong predictor of outcome from cardiac arrest. Uh, what really matters in cardiac arrest is actually your response time, and it appears that once in majority of our survivors, the survivors come at the scene. Uh, I know that Dr. Whitworth and I have had a lot of discussion about this over the years, and that and really, um, you know, it with cardiac arrest, it's not like trauma. In cardiac arrest, it's you as a responding agency are going to make the difference. If you get them back at the scene, they're likely to survive in the hospital. If you don't get them back at the scene, my experience has been very rare. There's always the odd one or two cases, but in general, the transport time makes no difference to me. I, th I see a few nods, so maybe some of you agree with me, in particular who've been doing this for a long time. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am, sorry. Uh huh. Uh, it's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. I asked a few questions, and I think that's why it's one of the limitations. We don't know what was influencing what, and I don't know the real answer to that. Uh, I think that 
We do know, for example, that uh, those of you who have used feedback, that feedback often gets turned off at least the voice prompts as well. And it's a, you bring up a really good point. I, I, I don't, since I wasn't out of the primary investigator, I don't have access to all the data. I don't know what happened in that particular. It's a great question. Uh, I think that uh, a study that you can anticipate happening in the future is a study that will look at probably 80, 100, and 120 uh, to see can we figure out the right rate in a randomized control fashion. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Dana Zive, and I work at OHSU as a research data manager with the Resuscitation Outcomes Consortium. I've been doing this for about five years, and I've had a really amazing opportunity to have sort of an in-depth understanding of EMS data, and I absolutely love it. We've been talking a lot today about um, CPR and uh, the way to treat out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, and so we wanted to talk to you a little bit today about uh, what is available from your cardiac monitors. I want to go ahead and let my co-presenter introduce himself. My name is Cliff Free, and I'm the EMS officer at Camas Fire Department, which is a local transporting fire department. So we saw earlier that we already have pretty good survival in what is a really difficult to treat population, right? So what we want to look for is any additional information that we can get to figure out why we do so well and also where we can still improve. So what we have an amazing opportunity to use are files directly out of your cardiac monitors that can collect data during the performance of CPR and allow us to see things like hands-on time and all this compression information that's been discussed, as well as pauses um, in treatment. We want to talk today about how data from these files are useful at a lot of different levels for crews, for agencies, and for us on a higher level in research. So what is it that we actually see from these files? Well, here locally in Clark County, Physio Control Life Pack 12s and Life Pack 15s are the primary monitors used. And they generate for us this sort of real-time report of what's happening during a code. I don't know how well you can see it here, but the black line is actually the patient's waveform. You see the patient's rhythm, and then laid over that is a green line that actually shows us impedance, and we're able to see every compression, every ventilation, as well as pauses for shocks. On the right-hand side of this report, we're able to see sort of major events in the resuscitation, things like vital, vital signs when they're taken, 12 leads, administration of drugs, and when you guys annotate, uh, return to spontaneous circulation. This gets summarized into what we call a CPR report card. On the left-hand side, it starts with a little bit of patient information, as well as the initial rhythm. And then it gives us a minute-by-minute -minute summary of a lot of CPR quality metrics. We're able to see every one of those red lines is a compression, every little red triangle is a shock, and then over on the right is a collection of data that gives us the information that people like Mo were talking about earlier. So we're able to see what is the proportion of each minute where compressions were being done. What is that rate? How can we look at that rate both in every minute and over the entire length of the code? We are lucky to have a lot of local experience with this data. For the last five years, we've been collecting this information from the four county region from three different device manufacturers, Philips monitors, Zoll monitors, and here in Clark County, physio control monitors. You can see that across the whole four county region, we've collected about 1,700 of these files so far. For the EPISTRI, which is an epidemiologic registry of cardiac arrests, we've collected almost 1,000 of these, with more than 200 of them coming from Clark County. In PRIMED, the, uh, the study that Mo presented, we collected a lot more of these. We actually were able to collect these files in about 70% of the cases that were treated so that we could look at the stats that really let us know whether or not there was difference um, in that study. And from Clark County here, you can see that we collected about 221 during that about 18-month period. So I've shown you what there is. Now I want to talk about what it's useful for. Uh, there's individual case information like I showed you. Each one of those reports is perfect for things like QA and QI, but it also tells us when we're doing a research protocol a lot about what protocol was actually implemented. If you were doing analyze early or analyze late, we didn't know how much CPR you actually did unless we looked at your monitor file. So it gives us really critical time data. <coughs> We're also able to look at a lot of different cases from either one agency or across an entire system to be able to aggregate information 
to look at CPR quality across multiple cases and look at things like trends. Maybe there's trends in initial rhythm or a relationship between the quality of CPR or the quantity of CPR with outcome. We're also then able to look at this with other available data, things like medication timing, the impact of medication provision, time that gets taken out before and after shock, or even with um, intubation, to be able to really better understand the context of the treatment of out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. So there's been several recent studies that have used this cardiac monitor data, both the locally provided data and data that's been provided from a number of other sites. As we've all mentioned, so PRIMED, that was one of the big, large, randomized clinical trials that used data from these cardiac monitors. But there's also been some really interesting observational studies. There was a very cutting-edge study done with ROC where over 500 of these monitors, the most ever compiled at that time, monitor files, most ever compiled at that time, were looked at for patients who presented with a shockable rhythm and found a more than two-fold increase in survival for patients who either got the lowest amount of time spent on the chest in the period prior to defibrillation versus those who had between 61 and 100 percent of each minute um, spent doing active compressions. So that was really a big, big push. You guys know we're now talking a lot about continuous compressions. It's important to know that these protocols are actually coming from data that's being created within our own county and our own network. <coughs> this is not just being done nationally or locally, it's also being done internationally. There was just a published uh, study that look, looked at the feasibility of collecting these cardiac monitor files for every treated out of hospital cardiac arrest case in Denmark. They were able to do this for over 85% of the cases for a month, and it's really changing the way that cardiac arrest treatment is being looked at. There's finally also been some studies that have looked specifically at interaction with the cardiac monitors themselves. Within ROC, there was, what's, uh, there was a study called the Real-Time Feedback Study. It looked at about 1,600 cases um, across three ROC sites that were treated um, from, with agencies who use the Philips monitors that are actually able to provide both audio and visual real-time feedback. And they found that the provision of feedback actually uh, created better CPR. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, and by better CPR, what they looked at is more time spent on the chest, uh, more, uh, thank you, better compression depth, and also uh, fewer incomplete releases. So these are all the things that we talked about having a big impact, in, for example, in the ITD study. So we finally now have a way to see, is what you're doing what we really think we're doing, and does it make sense um, as far as protocols that are being implemented? There's another study that actually was just published in Germany looking at different methods of feedback, and this is an important one because we do know things like metronomes can often get turned off when you get on scene. So the idea of having something either in your monitor that doesn't get turned off or that is a little bit more of a visual reminder might actually be a little easier to use. So we've definitely talked about national and international utilization of, these, of this file data, but I'm going to turn it over to Cliff so we can talk about how this can work locally for your agencies. All right, well, agency utility really comes down to two questions. Do we really understand what goes on in a code, and are we really doing what we think we're doing? Never before have we had the ability to review field calls with the kind of, of data, the kind of definitive feedback that we can get from these cardiac monitor files. Um, these files give us objective measures of time. Um, these files can tell us whether we're doing our 200 compressions in two minutes. They can also tell us if once we add analyzing, defibrillating, and administration of medications, whether that's stretching out those CPR intervals. Um, it also does another thing for us. It tells us how long it takes to implement a new protocol or a change in a protocol. So you have to realize that cardiac arrests are relatively infrequent calls. So you might get trained in March, but it might be June or July, maybe even November, December, until you find yourself as a provider actively in charge of cardiac arrest call. So this gives us an ability to see how long it takes field crews to be able to effectively administer a new protocol and do it well. Um, that's something we haven't been able to track before. In the past, it's mostly been anecdotal. What you said you did on scene, you did on scene. We weren't able to see what actually happened. Um, there's another thing on this slide I want to talk about, and that has to do with the context for pauses and CPR. 
there is a misnomer from the agencies that have started using these cardiac monitor files, and that is I no longer need to give you um, a PCR or an MIR, patient care report, um, or a medical instrument report, whatever the moniker your agency puts on that care report, because all the information is right there. You have this file, you already know what I did. I don't need to write a long descriptive PCR report. In actuality, the opposite is true. Um, these cardiac monitor files can't stand alone. They need to be in concert with a good PCR. The PCR needs to have a good scene description. Uh, and the reason is this. Those of us who work in the field, which is the lion's share of the people in this room, um, understand that for us in our world, people don't have cardiac arrest in an ED or in an ICU where there's lots of doctors and lots of nurses around. Um, people have cardiac arrest in the third floor, diminutive upstairs bathrooms with no space between the commode and the shower. That's where people die. Um, extricating these people is very difficult. It causes lapse in CPR because of our inability to do it while we extricate these people. Those are the, des the descriptions that you need to put in your PCR so that the research side of it can annotate the cardiac model files and, and have a description of when these lapses or pauses in, in CPR took place and why. Um, I have in, in my mind's eye kind of a, a idea for a far side-esque cartoon where there's a cardiac arrest that happens on the 10th floor of an apartment building and it's a viable patient and, they're trans and, and they go to, to extricate the patient and they're in the elevator and they're doing CPR and on the ninth floor the elevator stops and a grandmother walks in holding the hand of a small boy. And so the EMS crew pumping away is doing the best they can um, not to verbalize what they're thinking for obvious reasons. And um, the grandmother staring at the ceiling, not wanting to look at the dead guy. And the unattended boy looks up and sees the floor buttons and reaches up and with one hand hits all the floor buttons between the eighth floor and the lobby. So my point is we're not going to always run codes in the 10th floor of an apartment building, but there's always going to be a small boy. When we get dispatched to the call, we're not gonna know what that is. The research people in their, um, their ivory data palaces, you work in an ivory I palace, right? Yeah. Ivory. Um, <laughs> are so far removed from our scene, they don't know what our little boys are. That's what your PCR for, is to fill in that information so that they can clean up the data and decide what is good data and what is not good data. And then we can use that for what is a reasonable lapse because of an, uh, an inevitability that we couldn't predict in CPR and what is a lapse in CPR due to you know, poor provider. Um, logistics. This comes down to a simple question. What do we have to do to make this work? Um, well, there's no such thing as a free lunch. Um, the, uh, the reward is handsome, increased survivability, but it also requires more obligation on our part, more training. Um, the first thing we need is a set protocol and we need to consistently implement that protocol. Only through that consistency can we really tie treatment to outcomes. Um, the other thing is that we need to make sure our monitors are in the correct mode. So we use physio control in Clark County. They need to be in the paddles mode. As far as um, cardiac arrests go, there's four Ps. There's power, paddles, patches, and protocol. As soon as you start CPR, you turn the power on. Um, when you turn the power on, you make sure it's in paddles mode. You apply the patches and then you follow the protocol. Um, without being in paddles mode, we cannot collect the monitor files. The machine will not, re will not read and record it. Um, after the code, we have to have a system in place to be able to efficiently and effectively remove that file from the monitor. These life pack monitors by physio control have a finite amount of storage ability, which means subsequent calls after the cardiac arrest call will overwrite the prior calls if you run out of room. So we need to have a system in place that we can retrieve those quickly. Um, 
and this is mostly for EMS directors and training officers, but then we have to have device software that can read those codes um, so that we can extract the information that we need for our own internal QA, QI, and also so that we can, we can forward the, be the rest of it um, to the research. In conclusion, this is all about the little picture versus the big picture. As field providers, we're very familiar with the little picture. We get dispatched to a cardiac arrest, we go, we run the cardiac arrest for a short period of time, we take care of this patient until we drop him off at the hospital, we turn over care, and then we go back to our stations or back to our street corners, and we're on to the next call. Um, the big picture is there are very bright people in places very far removed from our scene that are looking at the treatments that we do to determine if indeed that is the most effective treatment for these patients. Um, when we're in the field, oftentimes if the research requires us to do an additional step, we fail to do that step because we think in our mind um, patient care comes first. That's our number one priority. If we get some research out of it, that's great, but not at the expense of patient care. The question that comes up is, we don't know if that's the best patient care. Only through collecting this data and giving this data to very bright people and who are expending a considerable amount of resources to look into this information can we determine if that was the best care or if there's an even better care out there. So it's only going to be the cooperation between um, us in the field and the research that we can, you know, push the limits of, of our scope. If, and I'll just say this really briefly in closing, um, if we can raise survivability two points, just two percent, which seems probably for the majority of this room insignificant, you're talking about a hundred people just in our four county region that were at one time dead, pulse lift synapnic, that are going to go home to their friends and family. If you extrapolate that out to the whole United States, you're talking about thousands of people. And that's just raising the survivability two points. So this is exciting. Get excited about it. Do what you can to contribute the data so that we can find the best outcomes. Are there any questions? Thanks, Cliff. Any, any questions? Yes. Uh, Torsades is its own rhythm uh, we did not look at individually. I'm going to look to the clinical folks in the room. Is, does it fall, is it categorized along with any other rhythms? Craig, sorry. <laughs> I'm a data person. This is where I get to hand it off to our clinical team. I'm going to say in, in general it's categorized as VFVT. So it's looked at the same as other shockable rhythms but not in isolation. So answer your question, it wasn't looked at separately and sometimes can be sort of difficult to tell the difference between that and other, you know, VFVT type rhythms. And uh, also along with VFVT, because uh, patients can be included in these studies when they um, have received treatment from uh, the application of a lay AED, we also include any sort of AED shock in there as well. Any other questions about monitor files? Mark? Dana, you talked about um, being able to gather and, and clear me up if I'm mistaken, but 70% of the data from Clark County now, was that specific? 70% of the cardiac arrest that happened in Clark County? So the 70% was specific to the primed cardiac arrest study. So it was a big part of our protocol that we really requested and tried to require, in a way, getting these monitor files for treatment. When you look at EPISTRI, which is the registry of cardiac arrest, we have a total of about 30% of our treated cases that we have monitor files for. We're working to increase that with every individual agency um, because our goal would be to have them for absolutely everyone uh, because it just really enhances the information that's available. One of the things we, we face in a system where we have multiple ALS agencies responding, surprisingly, is actually even being able to be very sure whose monitor is actually used. Um, it's one of those things that you guys on scene, of course, know, no question. But if in a flow chart we see both people uh, talking about rhythms or even both people talking about placing pads, we kind of have to go with best guess as to which agency actually may have that monitor file. So it's another thing to remember when you're charting. 
Thanks, Mark. Uh, Dr. Whitworth? Yeah, as Dr. Whitworth mentions, there there is there are places where absolutely everything is recorded from the initiation of resuscitation all the way to delivery of the patient at the hospital. Not something that we're doing locally. Dr. Daya? So I think one of the important things about the CPR process file is that we know how we know that one of the things that determines determines outcome is the quality of CPR. There's papers that show that if you do good CPR, you have better outcome. And so that's why you need those files. Those files essentially allow us to make sure that All right, folks, I'm gonna, I want to keep us moving here. Um, thanks very much to Cliff and Dana for that presentation. Uh, next up is Dr. Whitwer. Following his presentation, there's going to be about a 10, 15-minute break, so if you need to use the restroom, get more food, that sort of thing. Uh, and um, I'll, I'll mention that at least Dr. Dye and myself will be um, here during the break and afterwards. If you guys have other questions you didn't get a chance to or didn't want to uh, vocalize during the session, please come hit us up. Thanks, Craig. Usually they take their break during my presentation, so that's a, be a nice change. Um, all right, I'm going to discuss a little bit about dispatch guided CPR. As you know, we've been doing dispatch um, uh, telephone CP or so called telephone CPR uh, for several years in most, uh, in most agencies. Uh, but the question has come up is whether standard, teaching standard, old American Heart Association CPR with interposed ven with ventilations uh, uh, versus compression only CPR. We know that bystander CPR is associated with improved survival in cardiac arrest. We have lots of data on that now. Seattle has incredible data on that. Uh, However, and you saw from our, from the data locally, rates of bystander CPR is very low. Uh, our rate is about 40 percent on the, the rock study for this area. However, uh, around the country it's about 30 percent, and which means that in several places nobody gets CPR. One barrier is thought to have been that uh, people don't like to do mouth-to-mouth -mouth ventilation especially if they haven't been trained to it. And there has been, been a very low, uh, uh, in most communities, very low uh, CPR training for laypersons. Um, uh, Seattle had some experience, uh, the, the, the King County, not Seattle so much, but King County itself has, has now uh, gotten police to be first responders and to do compression-only CPR. When they said you could do compression only CPR, the police jumped at the idea because they didn't have to do mouth to mouth or worry about ventilations. So the thought is that dispatch assisted telephone CPR, compression only, might increase the risk of bystander CPR. And with that, there would be a potential benefit and 
Uh, there's a study will show that shows that perhaps compression only CPR might be better than full American Heart Association standard CPR. Two randomized studies in the last, well, reported this last year. Uh, one meta-analysis, a meta-analysis, so they take a whole bunch of individual studies, put them together, and then reanalyze it from that. And then one large observational study that we'll talk about. So first article um, by uh, Tom Ray is uh, one of the researchers, a delightful guy up in Seattle uh, who is actually a working doctor. He works in the, uh, uh, he's an internist, works at uh, uh, Harborview. Um, and this is called the DART study, Dispatcher Assisted Resuscitation Trial. Uh, King County, Thurston County, and uh, also a, c a contribution from London, from the UK. Uh, randomized control, this was a randomized controlled study. So uh, they were r randomly assigned to dispatch assisted standard CPR or compression only CPR. Almost 2,000 patients, both witness and unwitness arrest. There was absolutely no difference in outcome, which meant that neither one was considered better than the other. Although if you look at the data, look at the results, you have, although it's not st statistically significant, uh, there in both cases compression only had, sl had slightly more survivors. Not statistically significant, probably real significant for the, for the half a dozen people that did survive, however. Then they did a subgroup analysis and on certain subgroups, depending on the presenting rhythm, whether it was a shockable rhythm, V-fib, pulses V-tac, um, there were potentially more survivors in the compression only, but that wasn't 100% true. Then a nice study from Sweden, uh, another random control study of dispatch assisted standard CPR versus compression only, 1,300 patients witnessed arrest only, not, I didn't see grandma for an hour, I walked in and she was not responsive in the bad, it had to be witnessed arrest. Once again, no difference in outcome except no statistical significance, however, slightly more in the compression only CPR. Then a meta-analysis, they looked at three random control trials and seven observational studies. Once again, compression only versus standard CPR. And the outcome was for uh, random control trials, there was better survival in the control, in the uh, co continuous compression. 14% versus 12%. But in the observational studies, there was no significant difference. This was a five-year observational study in Arizona where the community CPR standard over that five-year period was compression-only CPR training. They did not teach ventilations to laypersons. So this was a study of no CPR versus conventional CPR versus compression-only by standard CPR. Now, don't ask me where they got the if they're only training people to do compression only, where did they get, I guess it's snowbird country. So all the people that came in from Minnesota and from Wisconsin during the winter knew how to do standard American Heart Association uh, CPR. But the rest of them did, did compression only CPR. Their results were pretty astounding. And, it, and there are studies to prove whether this is true or not. No bystander CPR, 5% survival. Conventional CPR, 7.8%, 8% survival. Compression only CPR, 13.5%. So the adjusted odds of survivor, which survival, which is a one, basically the simple thing is, it, it, statistical thing, it says that you had a, you had a 160% uh, better chance of surviving if someone did compression only CPR than if they did standard CPR. 
And the bystander CPR increase, which is the other thing, little study, a little side effect of the study is that it's easier to train people to do this, and they like to do this, and they jump their bystander CPR from 28% over a five-year period to 40%. So they increased it by 12% by teaching compression only. Now, local experience. Uh, Washington County has been using, which is WCCA, has been using compression only CPR since 2008. Now, they did retain airway opening, but uh, uh, BOAC, which is Multnomah County, uh, and uh, Lake Oswego, I don't think are using compression only, but they're probably going to go to it. CRESA has been using a modified um, American Heart Association standard for the last year, but we are training them as of next month to go to full compression only CPR if we can get through the MPDS, uh, the dispatch uh, um, uh, rules that uh, they're governed under. Nice thing about compression only CPR for the bystander, you know, Seattle uses compression only CPR and they have been using it for about four years now. Simplified instructions, they increase the bystander CPR rate that way, and we think it will re increase the cardiac arrest survival rate. A couple of questions we need to ask about that. Do you still need to open the airway? Well, the recommendations for compression-only CPR is, if you, is for adults who are in a probable, the bystander, the, uh, uh, the dispatcher has to make the decision. If you think it's a cardiac arrest, and we've asked them questions very carefully now. They're not supposed to say, do they have agonal respiration? Who, who knows what agonal respiration is if you're a layperson? Uh, they're not supposed to ask, is he breathing? The question is, is he breathing normally? And then, are they, are they responsive? If those two answers are no, they suggest then that you do that you start to say, we're going to do, we are going to do CPR. You don't say, would you like me to teach you how to do CPR? Say, we are going to do CPR. Get them flat on the floor, begin pushing on the chest, and it, you know, do that whole instruction. Now, for children or for persons you think this is an asphyxial arrest, Drowning in the bathtub, drowning in the in the back in the pool, etc. Obviously, you want to do. You probably want to continue to recommend opening the airway and doing some breathing. So, for overdose, drowning, asphy asphyxiation, those are not standard cardiac arrests. Those are respiratory arrests. Now, is there any harm from unnecessary CPR? I'll. Next slide will talk to that. How long can bystanders do CPR? Well, it's probably, there, there's beginning to be an estimate that they can do 50 compressions at a time reasonably comfortably. It's really hard for a bystander, really hard for a 80-year-old lady to do 200 compressions in two minutes without a rest. It's really hard for you guys to do that too, it turns out. <laughs> you know. And then there needs to be a little bit of, you know, there's a lot of people that have AEDs now. We have some really interesting tapes we've reviewed from the Cressa tapes here where uh, they do have AEDs, but nobody knows what the darn thing is. So. This is an article that came out uh, also by, it's, uh, by Mickey Eisenberg, who's, the, uh, uh, who's my counterpart for, for King County, and uh, a great researcher, uh, has a uh, resuscitation academy in Seattle, which is uh, an, an excellent thing to go to. Um, and this is a, they wrote this article after, as they culled out some stuff from their article on bystander-assisted CPR, compression only. And they looked at risk, what risk is there to the patient who's not in cardiac arrest, who happens to 
be misidentified by the by the bystander and the and the dispatcher as possibly cardiac arrest or is there a danger in that they had 1700 patients 55 percent of those people were in arrest but they were thought to be in, but 100 percent of them were thought to be in arrest by both parties 18 percent of those not in arrest almost 300 people got CPR and when EMS arrives they are not in cardiac arrest, and they were never in cardiac arrest, probably. Well, we don't think they were in cardiac arrest. The outcomes for these people who were not in cardiac arrest and who got CPR were 12%, 29 of them had some discomfort 